Hey everybody. I'm really glad to be here. I say this every time I'm here. This is my favorite place to read. That's just, that's just a fact. Joan and I were walking across the lawn. I just started crying. That's not true. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we were all so sober. I mean, we could have. We could have. I mean, I could, it. I, I mean I, it could happen. It did. Um, and, um, you know, I was here. I, I taught here and did some other work here from 19 seven, 1987 to 1988. And um, this always feels like home. It really is. It just is home. Such dear friends. You know, Bush Oven and, of course, Ed and Ann, Paul. Had in, in Ron Bays, who I have always, and David Herr, and Betsy, and um, Ron Bays, who I've always referred to as my literary godfather, and, and he just is. He put his arms around me um, way back in 1985, and was just so extra kind to Joan and I, and just, wow, it's just so nice to be here always. So I'm going to just read a little bit, and, and I'm glad to answer questions, if you have questions. I have a brand new book that just came out. It's um, it's a book of, of <coughs> essays, autobiographical essays. So I want to le at least read one from that. The name of the book is called uh, Half of What I Say is Meaningless, and it comes from it comes from John Lennon's song Julia from the White mm -hmm. Album. That starts out half of what I say is meaningless. You guys know that that song? Of course you do. You don't? Well, you should you should Google it. <laughs> Julia by, by John Lennon from the White Album. Um, and and the rest of those other three guys he hung out with too. <laughs> so um, this, this essay is called Shuffle Town. There's a little town in North Carolina. Um, Oh, north of Charlotte on Highway 16, heading out towards Gaston <laughs> County. And Joan and I, my wife, we had been house parents for abused and neglected children for one year in Monroe, North Carolina, Union County, which is just a couple counties west of here. So we did that for one year, and then we moved to this little place called Shuffletown. And let me just read it. I think it, it, it tells its own story. In Shuffletown, Joan and I lived in a tiny yellow cottage with floor-to-ceiling windows along its southern face. It looked out on Highway 16, two dozing lanes of blacktop north out of Charlotte, 741 feet above sea level, about a quarter mile from the Catawba River Bridge in the Gaston County line. At dawn, sunlight swept through the naked panes and spilled through the house. We'd watch it pool in the front room, have tea, then go back to bed. When we woke, we hiked down to the river and floated on cheap blow-up rafts. On the water loomed Laura's Rozelle house, a mammoth antebellum three-story shotgun house where you sat at a table with strangers and ate off the same platters fried chicken, country ham, red-eyed gravy, crab apple jelly, cat head biscuits. The famous Shuffletown dragway was a quarter mile south. Every night we heard its revving engines and the whistle of burning rubber. And in the lone autumn and winter we hid out in Shuffletown, glimpsed through the stripped trees, the burning headlights of the jacked up suicidal Falcons and Chevy Twos. We were happy living in Shuffletown, renting by the month for $165. No one knew who or where we were. Directly across from our yellow house listed a forgotten, nameless country store with a couple of dead pure pumps and the rutted gravel lot. The spindly, rusted carcass of a depression Ford tractor, like a praying mantis, leaned against the side of it. On the other side, a rotted, sooty bay, years of grease on its black, kaleidoscopic floor out of which launched towering sunflowers. The owner had wiry hair, the color of rye whiskey, bristling out of a Detroit Tigers baseball cap, broken nose, <coughs> hard-lived and handsome before God and women, the blue eyes of a good man who had failed at doing good things, decent teeth, scar under his left eye, 
two heavy days of red clay beard he aimed to shave, a flannel shirt and jeans, beat cowboy boots, a cigarette in his mouth for smoldering on the counter, often forgotten, scorching another brown caterpillar into the rough wood patina. Cigarette smoke cloaked him in the smell of Swedish raw tobacco. I imagined him wholesale even then, the conflated archetype of every slick country boy rounder I'd run up on in the southern wild and had the pleasure of knowing. I tend to like that pedigree, a hapless good guy, a dreamer, just trying to make a buck, firing up one lucky after another. In my neighborhood, back in Pittsburgh, his doppelganger huckstered out of an automobile trunk, suits and shirts, cigarettes and nylons, and made petty book in his cellar on weekends. An aces guy all the round, born athlete and poet, visited his mother on the weekends. But I knew this Shuffletown fellow best from a prison yard where he had likely paced in green fatigues waiting to max out after his latest bonehead jolt. Cars or women, his fists, all three, booze for certain. This fellow sold cigarettes, hoop cheese and slab bacon, pork rinds and crackers, sodas and beer, big yellow net sacks of roasted Georgia peanuts, STP, Pennzoil, maple syrup, chow chow, this and that, whatever he latched onto in one of his quests, tack, even a couple of saddles, live bait, and pinball machine. One of the tired books in the short shelf he had for sale was a farewell to arms. He carried fruit cakes and beautiful packs of bicycle playing cards in blue and red paisley packages, all of it as if he had salvaged of another senescent store its inventory moments before its evanescence and simply threw on his floor and counters its estate of gauze of dust shrouded everything. I liked him, and I think he liked me, as if I were an outlaw too. I felt at the time I was, and more than anything, wanted to be anonymous. And he understood that, like, I, like him, I toted my own trove of secrets, that I'd never make trouble for him. I didn't have a warrant on me, but he might have. He had no name, though surely we introduced ourselves, but just as likely not. He was 50, I was 27, and pined to be more than anything a writer. We'd exchange pleasantries, weather, how you getting along, have a good one, yes sir, the parsed out code of anonymity, live and let live, let the dead bury the dead. Neither of us wanted trouble. We were united in this. I paid him for miraculous six packs of Carling Black Label. He pulled near frozen from under the counter upon which perched like a griffin, an ancient 65 pound battered chrome burrows cash register. Of course he didn't have the proper documents to sell me beer, but I reckon along with what regard he may have had for me. He figured me as well for a rube, an unwashed Yankee boy who didn't know any better. I hadn't been in the South long and my inflection betrayed me. And I was glad to play along for beer and wise potato chips and candy bars just across the scored blacktop from our pretty little house that no one at all knew about. Joan and I were his only customers. He called her Little Lady and was sweet on her. We never glimpsed another soul across his threshold. Then one day the pe place was padlocked and empty and took on instantly the long look of abandonment. A specter store that upon occasion mysteriously quickens back for a new run, its proprietor from another realm and time then fades in quietude like mist on the glass without a do or announcement receding into the misty kudzu marooned in the solemn country along what once was a pig trough. Not long after the store quit, Joan and I were awakened by a deafening explosion that shook our house. When I opened my eyes, the room was white with unearthly light, then went black like the switch when the whole world had been yanked. I was certain we'd been bombed. Joan worked woke crying, scrabbling in the pitch for a gown tangled in the bedclothes. I hustled her out of bed through stinking clouds of smoke out the front door into a tempest crackling with electricity. A massive pine tree lay across the hood of our 66 Fairlane. 
We stood in the deluge, holding each other, the haunted store across 16 flickering spastically in the voltage like a holograph. We went back in the house. I grabbed a flashlight. The house smelled charred and smoky, but there was no fire. The switch plates and receptacles had been blasted from their moorings. The walls were scorched. The light fixtures had detonated, glass strewn across the floors. We'd been struck by lightning. It was in the living room of the Yellow House, December 8, 1980. I was watching Monday Night Football when Howard Cosell abandoned his brilliant play-by-play -play and broke to the world in a stricken, theatrical voice the heart-stopping news that John Lennon had been shot four times in the back. It was the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. The store had been closed for months by then. Eventually, we were evicted. I'm going to read a very short story now. And, and the story is called, um, called Zeppola. And, and Zeppola is uh, it's like, a little, it's like a little fried cookie that Italian people make at the holidays. Easter and, and Christmas, and I think I really ex explain this. And then after I'm done with this story, I will tell you the inspiration for it. And this is narrated by a kid named Fritz Sweeney, who, uh, he's a half-breed, you know, half Irish and half Italian. So, uh, and he lives in Pittsburgh. His dad is a very pacific, gentle Irishman and his mother is a splenetic, homicidal Italian. <laughs> Zeppelin. My mother swears she's pregnant. She wants to cook, which she never does. In our house, my father handles the cooking. As recently as yesterday, she wasn't even speaking to us. But this baby, baby, she says, has her happy. She wants to make zeppola, little patties of dough fried in hot olive oil, then sprinkled with sugar. She has a craving, the way her mother used to make them. I don't remember ever eating them, but my mother assures me I have at my grandmother's, but we hardly see her anymore, and I'm not certain I'd recognize her if she crashed through the roof. My mother produces a white prayer book mm -hmm. with a tiny lock like an antique diary's with a key the size of an infant's thumbnail, she opens it. Should she drop to her knees, mumbling antiphonies like those insane Calabrian widows on Good Fridays at the graveyard, I will fall over dead in astonishment, and my father will join me. But she does not pray. Rather, she takes from the prayer book's withered secret pages a slip of frayed paper, and reading from it as she puffs on a Chesterfield, assembles the grayish, yellow mound of dough. My father sits reading the obituaries at the kitchen table, wearing a long white terry cloth robe with a black hex sign on the back. He looks like a prize fighter. He tells my mother that Philly Decker died and is laid out at Fabrero's. Did somebody shoot him or did he just eat himself to death? My mother asks. Doesn't mention says my dad. I thought he was too in love with himself to die. How will the world keep spinning? I think we should go see him, Rita, says my dad. You go. I never liked him, but please tell him I said hello. Your mother, Fritz, has no respect for the dead, he says to me, or for the living. He gets up and takes the newspaper into the living room. I follow him lie on my stomach on the floor with the comics and doze off as I sleep the dough hunkered in a glass bowl covered with a tea towel miraculously doubles in size. When I wake, I walk toward the kitchen. My mother in a pink summer nightgown stands at the ironing board running the steaming wedge back and forth across the collar of the black dress she wear to work. The iron occasionally hisses. From the radio, volume hiked way up. Elvis Presley, in a whispery voice, sings, I can't help falling in love with you. She sings along as she irons, fervently, churchy, then sways, 
guided by Elvis over the dance floor of dream. She's not noticed me. There are tears in her eyes. Behind her, like excelsior, sun sprays the window, silhouetting her, the gown chiseled in relief, her hair spun at her crown in filigrees, her face a marbled shadow of backlight out of which drifts, out of which drifts a disembodied yearning, not clearly my mother's. And for that instant, I am blinded and do not see until the sun flares off the Pentecostal flames from the ignited oil in the skillet raging behind her. Mom! I scream. She looks up, surprised, and smiles, still singing unabashedly, Take my hand, take my hold on to me. Then she turns and sees the fire licking at her. She grabs the wooden skillet handle, and the flames leap from the skillet to her gown, pour over it like liquid, and she is instantly engulfed. The music like Requiem, Elvis Presley like the cantor at high mass, looping incense over his mesmerized flock as the church burns, burns down. I can't move. I can't take my eyes off her, no longer my mother, like sacred art restored, an angel wedding fire. My father storms by me and scoops up my mother. He kicks open the screen door. There is an audible suspiration as he, too, catches fire, stumbling down the three concrete steps to the yard where he drops her, still clutching the spouting skillet in my swimming pool, then simply steps out of his fiery robe and leaps into the water beside her. The pool has sat in the little yard all winter. Leaves float on its surface. Neighborhood dogs drink out of it. The blue plastic bottom patterned with yellow cartoon fish with long lashed eyes and huge puckered lips is slick with algae. The round aluminum frame is caving. Unharmed, my mother and father sit next to each other in the pool, laughing. She and what's left of the charred pink gown, bit by bit it falls off her body and floats on the water like scraps of flesh. My father, is naked. Together they splash water on his burning robe until the flames die down and there is the sodden smell of fried terry cloth, the nubs at the end of each thread brown on white like blackened marshmallows. And um, the inspiration for this story <laughs> I should actually get Joan to tell you about this. When Joan and I first got married, she um, she and she regularly set herself on fire. <laughs> <laughs> she really did. In this particular story, we were going, we were going to a wedding. Um, I mean, three times she she <laughs> caught fire, just caught fire, and caught our bed pretty seriously on fire one night. Um, so we were on our way to a wedding, and I was in a shower, and music was just hyped. Right after we got married, the music was real, 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 real loud. So I come out of the bathroom and I have a white terry cloth robe on, and I walk into the bathroom and Joan is is ironing her dress to go to the the, um, the wedding, and she's in a slip, and behind her rages this out crazy, crazy grease fire, and you're like <laughs> a six alarm blaze is behind her, but the music is so loud and she's just singing, <laughs> and, 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 and so. I come out and I, and I, I say, Joe, you know, and, I, and I, I go and I grab the frying pan, it's a big um, cast iron skillet, and I take it, holding it as far away as I can from myself while it's just, you know, and sort of kick open the back door and go out, and as I'm going out, I, I catch on fire <laughs> and just storm out in the yard, throw the skillet, and then, you know, disrobe. Um, standing there naked in, in the backyard. Um, so that's the story behind that. I took some imaginative license. Can I just say something? <laughs> <laughs> Number one, what you were supposed to do in that instance is cover it. <laughs> just, just so you know. And number two, while that was raging behind me, I did catch a glimpse, and I, every time I turned back, 
it had died down. So it was one of these things that just kept kind of coming up and going down. So every time, I looked back three times, and every time I looked back, nothing was happening. So I just want to say that. <laughs> this is a historic occasion. This is really the first time that We've done sort of a duel. We've, we've, we've done it. We're doing it. She's never spoken. <laughs> Sweetheart, I'm going to call on you often. Um, and, and I had a book. I had a book of poems come out in the fall called Concertina. And I don't know if you can see it on the front. Is a guy playing a little squeeze box. It's an Italian squeeze box called the Concertina. But the concertina I'm thinking about in this particular book is the concertina, that awful silver razor wire that crowns prisons. And you'll see it just often. <coughs> and it was used as ramparts and barricades during various wars. And it, for me, is maybe the most salient image of prison. Joan and I actually came to North Carolina as Vista Volunteers in 1976. <coughs> um, Joan from Atlanta and myself from, <coughs> from Pittsburgh, and um, since we're telling stories on, on each other, um, I, we loosely met in prison, so. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is called, this, this poem is called Sweet Random. Um, when we came, to we, we were basically stationed around Charlotte, and we didn't have anywhere to live. There were about eight of us, so we all crashed at our Vista boss's house this tiny apartment in Charlotte and just, you know, couches, floors, sleeping bags until we could fan out and find our own digs. So this is called Sweet Random. That first week on the project, the four of us new vistas crashed at our boss's cramped flat. A Jewish girl from Bayonne, a Cuban whose preacher father was locked in a Castro's Havana jail. A girl from Atlanta and I, a Catholic from Pittsburgh, crammed together as we were, hot as fire, no air conditioning. At night we drank outside, smoldering, <coughs> as if on the brink of raising every prison in North Carolina. One day, after a long, fruitless search for my own place, the Atlanta girl, Joan Carey, emerged from the tiny bathroom wrapped in a towel, chestnut hair pinned atop her head into the full early evening sun blazing through the window. The towel buttery gold with wheat stalks and full blonde raiment, clouds of pale chaff and the pollinated light of what would be another long, sultry <coughs> August night in Charlotte. She and I, up to that point, had been friendly, even circumspectly affectionate, dazed by the sight of her in nothing but a towel, the sun stealing over us. I knew little of her, perhaps less of myself, purely nothing of the lives of caged men. I envisioned prison as purgatory, a colossal furnace hoarding chits on me. Above all, so help me God, I felt blessed by those shackled men pulling my time as a forge. Forsaking home for toil among convicts, it had been rectitude I desired, an apparition bare and reckoning as an angel with a flaming sword. Ahead of me beckoned sweet random. All night I held it seared against me. Let me read a, a, a poem called Foot Locker. Um, <coughs> when I was leaving for to go to um, Vista, I had just finished graduate school. Um, I was the very first person with my name to even go to college. <coughs> and so my parents were especially <coughs> puzzled that I, after all of that, had decided to, to go be a Vista volunteer in North Carolina and work with criminals for $2,000 a year. Um, and my mother was really distraught. My dad wanted to buy me a foot locker. So the day before I left, you know, you, you guys know what a foot locker is. It's great. They're basically like big steamer trunks. Yeah, they're big trunks so I could just stash all my stuff. So the day before my father, and it might be the only time in my life that I ever went shopping with my father, as a matter of fact. So we went to the Army Navy store in downtown Pittsburgh to buy a footlock, the footlock. The day before I left Pittsburgh to work as a Vista volunteer in the prisons of North Carolina, my father drove me in the family car, an enormous 
two-door green Chrysler Newport downtown to the Army Navy store on Liberty Avenue. He was set on buying me a footlocker, something I had never dreamt of possessing, to pack everything I'd be taking. He and my mother were befuddled as to why I, having recently earned a master's degree, wished to spend my days among criminals, 500 miles from home for $2,000 a year. They had little faith in my car, a beat-up 69 VW Bug with no reverse. My mother wept. My father said nothing. In my recollection, he has never attempted to dissuade me from anything nor made public his desires two things for which I can't begin to express my gratitude. I didn't want a footlocker, but couldn't bring myself to tell him so. We wandered the store looking at switchblades, gas masks, live grenades, then purchased the footlocker. My dad wanted to get me something else. Realizing a refusal would be unkind, I picked out a denim cowboy shirt with pearl buttons. At the time, a real stretch for me, but in 24 hours, I'd walk away from my past. Style seemed irrelevant. Next door to the Army-Navy sprawled a string of porno shops. Once, I snuck into one with a friend. We squeezed into a booth and watched a 25-cent black and white clip that gaped at magazine jackets, contraptions, and novelties that belonged in a laboratory. A black curtain through which men passed in and out led to a back room. Such experiences, I'm certain, are not unusual among boys, yet standing that day on Liberty Avenue with my father, I was filled not with shame, but regret, because I was leaving and glad about it. I didn't require absolution, but I longed to tell him about slipping into that dive for all I know, and I realize now how little I know about the inside of my father. He too had been in one of those places before. But it was painful thinking about having something like this in common with my dad. And I valued above all else, and I think he did too, that we never spoke of such things. I was 23 years old, and that fact and the line of men I issued from entitled me to my silence. My father and I climbed back into the Chrysler and drove home to my mother in the last supper we would ever eat together on that still green side of my life. The next morning, I picked up I-79 and headed south. In the back seat of my car lay the footlocker, which I still own and used to store old manuscripts, notebooks, and letters that in all likelihood I'll never return to. Do you all remember the old PTL club, the show? Because that, that was Professor Bush Owen's favorite show. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very, very close friends. I have cups and... Uh, he was very <laughs> close friends with <laughs> the Bakers um, and helped found Heritage Village. Um, when I was a VISTA volunteer, Jim and Tammy Baker invited five inmates down to Heritage Village to be on the show. And I took them, okay? <laughs> I drove the prison van with the bars and the, the permanent tags, etc. cetera. Um, and there's just two things I need to tell you about that. that. Um, the day before, in the van that we traveled in, there had been some kind of scuffle, and one of the guards had maced these two guys who got into it. And the other thing is, once we got he there, we rehearsed. Um, we were all, s it's a huge TV studio, and it's very awkward, a great big thing. And they seated the, the six of us, these five guys in their honor grade green uh, prison outfits, um, right in the front row in my cell. And so they rehearsed that on the count of three from the backstage sound man, Jim would come to them with a microphone and they would all uh, in unison proclaim, praise the Lord. So we rehearsed that over and over and over again. I mean, I didn't have to, um, or I didn't have to do it, but, but the guys were, were rehearsed doing it. So again, this poem is called Praise the Lord. 
I was so new to North Carolina. Let me stop. Do any of you young people know what, what it was? This, have, you, have you heard about that show, probably? No. This was like middle 70s, maybe into 1980, and they were televangelists. They would get on TV and they would cry and weep and shake down like old ladies and crippled <laughs> folks for their money, <laughs> essentially. And um, they were later indicted and sent to prison. There was, a, there was, there was a, a rash of that for a while, I think. You know, Jimmy Swagger and all those people. But, but it, when I first came to North Carolina and I saw it for the first time, I had never seen it before, and I thought it was a comedy. I'm not even, I'm, I'm not being a smart aleck. I thought it was a complete satire. <laughs> <laughs> and I had never heard the term televangelists before either. I was so new to North Carolina, I thought the PTL Club a satire in the vein of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> Jim and Tammy's spoof of televangelists was brilliant. I laughed, even after I found out the truth. <laughs> when I arrived at Heritage Village, the PTL compound with five invited black felons, outfitted in forest green honor grade, the bakers <coughs> met us in the parking lot. <coughs> Sobbing, we lurched from the white prison van the day before, two guys had been maced in it for pulling shivs, and the fumes hadn't dissipated. Interpreting our tears for transports of the spirit, <laughs> Jim and Tammy began to cry and took us, one by one, into their arms. Their lavish grounds had an etched storybook opulence as if traced from a template and its colors coded in. As we strolled the packed studio, the guys affected as they often did in public, a stoic gangster nobility upon their faces a cross between glowering and amusement. More than anything, glad to be out of the joint for an afternoon, but ready to cut and run in a heartbeat. At a predetermined time, the inmates were to exclaim ensemble during the show when the cue came, praise the Lord. We rehearsed it a number of times. The guys loved seeing themselves on the monitors. They waved and mugged like kids. Then we were live. Jim's smile and big lapels. Tammy's face in the fiery stage lights. Andre Crouch and the disciples singing gospel, a litany of praise the Lord, drizzling over the immense crowd. We saw on the monitors what free folks at home saw as they watched us on TV in their living rooms. At intervals, the inmates flashed among the mendicants like returned prodigals. Then, from the offstage sound man, they received their cue. He held up finger number one, Jim suddenly holding the mic like a torch to their shocked faces as on the count of three, each camera in the studio pivoted toward them. They said nothing. <laughs> Neither smiled nor moved, as if God, in his almighty wisdom, his good taste and discretion, his infinite love, for the very least, had struck them stone. <laughs> read maybe three, three more poems, and then <coughs> I'm glad to take questions <coughs> if you all have them. <coughs> Joan, that's reminding me of that time Leroy Quintana up at ASU. This fellow was reading in, in our series up at ASU, and there was a young woman in the crowd who had a cough similar to Joan's, although <laughs> not so lovely, <laughs> of course. And um, every time she coughed, Leroy would say, Who's coughing? <laughs> Who's coughing out there? He kept doing this over and over and over. And, and finally, um, this young lady bursts into tears and <laughs> rushes out of, of the, the hall. And um, Leroy said, oh, I was just kidding. You know, and, but it was re really um, uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, you, you cough all you want. <laughs> people, people you. Um, I want to read a poem called South. Um, and it's about going home for the very first time after I was a Vista volunteer um, 
You know, we started in middle August of 76 and I went home for Christmas. And that was the first time I was home after living in the South. And I was so changed um, in, in all these really wonderful ways, not visually, <laughs> but I was, who's coughing? <laughs> <laughs> but I was really, really changed. Um, you know, we were doing what we felt was really, really righteous work. I was in the South that I had fallen in love with. We were living in Charlotte. We had developed this wonderful crew of, of great friends. Um, I had fallen rather precipitously in love. Um, so it was really great. And I always tell it everybody, if you can arrange to be about 500 miles apart from either set of parents, you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it made all the difference. It really did. So this is called South. At first Christmas, after four months working a road camp prison north of Charlotte, I caught a ride home to Pittsburgh with a Vista buddy before splitting we attended, attended the camp's AA Christmas party. Cookies, carols, drunkologues leavened with mildness and deference to the season. Mainly thankfulness, certain regret, but all about regeneration, how the path through sorrow had yielded its portion of enlightenment. Advent, dark and bitter cold for North Carolina, for anywhere, the first hours of what would prove the fiercest winter in a hundred years. When we hit Greensburg, PA, the extent of my lift, I hopped out, still 30 miles off to thumb the rest of the way, 4.30 in the morning, 11 degrees among a pack of played out stiffs on cardboard and rags beneath an overpass bridge, struggling too to get somewhere for Christmas. They wore the faces of time. I had learned by then to divine it. Guys no longer astonished by how quickly things go to the bad, who could weather it too, so little to lose, they didn't have to suffer the likes of me. Hitchhiking on the Pennsylvania Turnpike was against the law. I riveted my eyes to the frozen right away and prayed for first light. I rolled into the city in time for breakfast in my parents' kitchen, which sounds like the beginning of things. During the holidays, I played poker, drank a little beer, had final lunches with a couple girls, read George Jackson, Eldridge Cleaver, went to midnight mass with my parents, in my dad's mammoth Newport, I navigated a blizzard to a New Year's Eve party at the Mardi Gras, where a fight jumped off, and a Liberian Pinkerton opened a boy's head with his stick, batted to pieces the jukebox, then threw everyone out into the glowing, indifferent ice of 1977's inaugural morning. I wrote long letters to Joan Carey back with her family in Georgia. People asked how it was living down south. There were a few jokes about prison, but mainly no one wanted to know about it. For the first time, my life belonged to me, and I wanted to keep it secret. Joan in our unheated attic, the candles, standing in line with convicts at the canteen for a cup of chicory, the stink of the overheated cell block, prison cooks in whites, frying catfish in the chow hall, flies year-round the yard snare in blinding concertina, a slick of backwoods macadam jetting by the cadaverous trailers on Mount Holly Huntersville Road where chain gang guards once lived with their families. That winter, as far as the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, it snowed. 500 year old live oaks crashed to earth. Slow rivers froze. Copperheads furled deeper into the quick. And unless I forget, I really want to say how much this place has meant to me over the years, too, that I do really feel um, a, a, not just a special fondness, and I think I speak for Joan, too, but, but real love for St. Andrews. It's been a huge, huge part.